You know, when we take up our cross and we follow Jesus, we're not promised that life will always be easy. The storms will come. People will falsely say all kinds of evil against you, Jesus said. Following Jesus isn't always going to be easy. Jesus told his disciples that they would be hated and persecuted and insulted and and lied on. The storms of life will come. We will travel through some storms. You know, Satan attacks you because he sees that you are drawing closer to Jesus. That's a storm. You just got laid off from your place of employment. That's a storm. You're having trouble in your marriage. That's a storm. You're trying your best to raise a child who is rebellious. That's a storm. You're pregnant outside of marriage. That's a storm. You're behind in your bills. You just found out you have an incurable disease. Your little one is ill and you're not sure what's going on and neither are the medical people. You just experienced death in your family. You know, these are all examples of storms that come up in life, and we could just go on and on and on. But then, get this, the Bible tells us of a number of places where, in a number of places where God has allowed a storm to come into your life just to strengthen the faith and your faith. People like you and me, not all the storms are that way, but some are. Perhaps God has allowed a storm in your life for that very reason, to strengthen your faith. You know, I heard this week of a man who was not feeling very well, and so he decided to go to see his doctor. And while he was waiting in the doctor's reception area, a nun came out of the doctor's office. And she looked very pale, tired, worn, and disheveled. And the man went to the doctor's office and said to the doctor, I just saw a nun leaving here, and she looked absolutely terrible. I have never seen a woman look worse. And the doctor said, well, I just told her she's pregnant. The man said, oh, my, is she? And he said, no, but it sure cured her hiccups. (laughs) You know, perhaps God has allowed a storm in your life for that very reason, to strengthen your faith. In every storm and every trial of our lives, there is an opportunity for us to wonder again with the disciples concerning the identity and the authority and the majesty of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But our faith is strengthened in the process. I'd like for you to open your Bibles, if you would please, to Mark chapter 4. We're still studying through the book of Mark. Now remember that Mark's purpose in writing the gospel is really stated here in in chapter 1 of Mark. It's actually chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God. Mark, like all other writers, Matthew... Luke and John, has as his goal and his objective to make it clear, unmistakably clear, that Jesus is none other than God. We've seen that all the way through our studies thus far. That he is man, to be sure, but that he is God as well. God-man. You know, we're going to see this demonstrated magnificently, unforgettably in the passage that is before us here this morning. We will see a beautiful portrait of Christ Jesus, his humanity, and we will see a staggering demonstration of his deity as well, the Son of God. So if you look with me at Mark chapter 4, that's where we find ourselves this morning in our study, uh, beginning in verse uh, 35, and I invite you to take your outline out of your bulletin if you've yet to do so this morning. Don't have to, but it it makes it a little easier to to follow along and get the message. Uh, But Mark uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 35 to the end of the chapter. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, 
and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Well, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we, we thank you for our time together here today. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have to get into your word. And we're, we're so thankful that you have preserved this word for years and years and years over time. Uh, and Father, you've taken care that it, that it was preserved in a way that we can know, in fact, that it is the word of God. So Father, we ask your blessing on our study this morning. Open our eyes uh, to see, our ears to hear. Uh, the words that we, we do hear, uh, so that, Father, we can apply that to our lives. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. You know, uh, we are going to see this demonstrated, again, magnificently and unforgettably in the passage that is before us, this beautiful portrait of Jesus Christ and his humanity. And so what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to begin here uh, looking at some of the elements that, that's in our passage here. And, and so we see here in our text the boat as well as other boats. It was mentioned not only was there one boat, but there were other boats. And um, you might see a pic, there it is, a picture of the boat. You know, this is, by the way, a first century boat. I think I labeled it as such. It was found in 1986 on the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, so this may very well be the boat that, that Jesus was in. It may not be, but anyway, that's a, a, a reasonable fact, simile of what it, what it might have looked like. Of course, it wouldn't have been all eroded at the time. Hopefully not. And um, so anyway, I just thought I wanted to show you that picture just for the fun of it so you'd have some idea. I did see that um, boat when I was uh, in Israel. And uh, so verse 35 and 36, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Let us go over to the other side. So leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. You may recall the boat appeared for the first time in Jesus' ministry uh, back in Mark chapter 1. Back in Mark chapter, oh, no, I'm sorry, it was actually chapter 3, verse 9. Mark 3, verse 9, uh, the scripture here says, a request by Jesus, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding in. And you recall we did a study on that because there were so many people gathered around seeing Jesus and following him along day by day that the crowd just kept growing larger and larger. And there was uh, obviously... A concern about the crowd crushing in uh, on Jesus. And, you know, that happens when a large crowd gathers and they get excited. Maybe you've seen or heard of that at a, at a concert. And uh, we had some examples of that when we, when we studied uh, that text. So uh, at any rate, that's where the boat first appeared uh, in our text. Now, whether it was the same boat here in our text this morning or not, uh, not sure. They may have gotten another boat. But Jesus requested a boat to teach from, uh, again, simply because of crowds to hear him speak and, and work miracles had just grown phenomenally. Uh, and the crowds pushing against Jesus could not only cause harm to him, but it could cause harm to his followers as well. And, and so the, the scene of Jesus teaching from the boat was repeated on a number of different occasions. It became a, a pretty good thing. I mean, the, the water acted as sort of a reverberator of, of his voice. And then with the uh, hills and the mountains in the background, it was sort of like an amphitheater. And so the crowds of people could hear him, hear him well. Now, Peter, James, and John, as you all know, were fishermen uh, with their home in Capernaum on the northwest end of the Sea of Galilee. And it would not have been difficult at all for them to... Uh, uh, take care of the request of Jesus to, to get a boat. And so that's what happened. They got a boat and Jesus began to uh, teach people from the lake time and time again uh, by standing uh, in a boat. Now, if we go back to our text, 
uh, verses 35 and 36. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, and I realize I keep repeating this, but you know there's nothing a better learner than repetition. So let us go over to the other side, Jesus said, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat, and there were also other boats with them. Now, if you'll see there in the text, it says that day, that day. Uh, chapter 4, verse 35, uh, that day. Well, what day? What day are they talking about? Well, it was the day that Jesus had been teaching and, and telling parables. And day turned into evening, and Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to uh, the other side. And so verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat and there were also other boats following along. So uh, there's been speculation as to why Jesus wanted to go to the other side. Um, you know, maybe it would have been less crowded over there because the cities weren't quite as populous up in that area as they were where he was teaching at the time. So it could be that he wanted to go to the other side just to start teaching over there. But again, uh, not a lot of people. So it could be maybe the disciples and he, even he needed some rest. So maybe that's why uh, he went. Or maybe he was finished teaching on this side of the lake and decided that he'd get a fresh start uh, in the morning. So as they begin to leave, the crowds on the shore, the other boats carrying others on the lake, begin to follow Jesus and his disciples. And obviously, these were followers of Jesus. Now, some may have been seekers. They may not have been dedicated, committed followers of Jesus. Uh, they may have been seekers just wanting to learn more about Jesus. Or maybe there were uh, true believers as well. We don't know for sure. But the, the crowd, I'm sure, was mixed. And, but it's something I'd like for you to keep in mind, I'm just going to throw this out there. Large crowds do not always mean more believers, okay? Large crowds do not always mean more believers. Now, another element. We've looked at the boats, so let's look at verse 37 and 38. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So another element I want you to see here is this furious squall. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat uh, so that the boat was just nearly swamped. And so they were in the midst of a storm. Jesus was in the stern of all things, sleeping on a cushion. It says that right here in our text. Don't ask me why they said he's sleeping on a cushion. I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a good thing that they included it. And we do know that Mark was gathering all kinds of information because he was not an, an eyewitness to these events, much like uh, the other disciples. So he gathered information from all of the other disciples and so on. So uh, he's very detailed, like a journalist would be. So a furious squaw came up, Jesus sleeping on a cushion. You know, the Sea of Galilee is very notorious uh, for its storms. The Sea of Galilee, which is really a, a large lake, is what it is. It's below sea level with mountains rising uh, in the east, but on the west are the Judean hills, and they bend and twist so that there are narrow corridors, uh, which the winds often roar down, and uh, violent storms come up very quickly, and to the east is the area known as the Golan Heights, and that's a more mountainous area. Uh, on the west, it's hilly. Uh, on the east, it's more mountainous. And, you know, uh, Jim Kosek, are any of you familiar with Jim Kosek from WAND? He would say, the warm air came up from the west, and the cold air came up from the east, and boom, the storm came about. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Jim, you think I'm losing my mind. And don't, and don't doubt that, because I may be. But... Because of the terrain uh, surrounding the Sea of Galilee and its geography, it, it is notorious for, for its storms. It had been a tough day, and Jesus was exhausted from the crowds. He had fallen asleep in the stern of the boat despite the storm. And did you notice he even had a cushion? I brought that up. Now, the Greek translation for that cushion, I might as well go ahead and build on that a little bit, is a head pillow. That's exactly what it was. It was nothing more than that, a head pillow, something that perhaps a fisherman would use in the boat to lay their head down and rest. But remember, Mark did not have the eyewitness accounts, as I said. 
And so he's just collecting all kinds of information. Now, the disciples were panicked. Uh, since the waves were threatening to swamp the boat, uh, the fact that the disciples were frightened tells us something about the nature of the storm. Uh, it must have been a pretty bad storm. Remember that at least four of these disciples were experienced fishermen. Uh, they had seen storms before. This was not their first storm. They had survived storms before. And so they knew uh, what to do in a storm. But this one sent them into a panic. That just tells you how bad of a storm uh, worked up that day. And it was getting dark. I mean, it was evening, so it was getting darker and darker, which made things a bit more ominous and worrying. The disciples woke Jesus and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? I mean, are you kidding me right now? Asking Jesus, don't you care? I mean, how long have they been with him? Jesus' followers obviously still did not have an understanding of what Jesus was going to do for them in time, in fairly short order, really. They must not have understood Jesus' mission and who Jesus was and what he was going to do for them. You know, the prophet Isaiah, if you'd turn with me there, it's back towards the middle of your Bible. If you kind of take a left turn there from Mark. Isaiah chapter 53 I just want to look at a couple of verses, and they're verses that you all are very familiar with, but just talking about what Jesus uh, has done for us, and of course, we could just read all through the Bible and see the things that Jesus has done for us, but in uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah, beginning in verse 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that, should desire, that we should desire him. Now this is Isaiah prophesying about our master, Jesus. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Look with me at verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, and yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But listen at this. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And by his wounds we are here. Don't you care? I mean, are you kidding me? Don't you care? Look with me at verse 39 of our text. Mark chapter 4. He got up, that's Jesus, rebuked the wind and said to the waves. You know, I kept thinking that that was going to say in my study there that instead of rebuking the winds, I thought sure he was going to get up and say that he rebuked the disciples. <laughs> he rebuked the disciples But no, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Not just a little bit calm, it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? Perhaps God has allowed a storm to strengthen the faith uh, of his followers. Maybe that's why he allowed this storm to come in. You know, he allowed Satan to come in on Job's life. Do you remember that? you remember that? It's all to strengthen your faith. James Thomas Fields, he wrote a poem. And that poem is entitled, 
the captain's daughter. Something for you to think about. I'd like to share those words with you. We were crowded in the cabin. Not a soul would dare to sleep. It was midnight on the waters, and a storm was on the deep. Tis a fearful thing in winter to be shattered by the blast and to hear the rattling trumpet thunder. Cut away the mast. So we shuddered there in silence for the stoutest held his breath while the hungry sea was roaring and the breakers talked with death. As thus we sat in darkness, each one busy with his prayers, we are lost, the captain shouted as he staggered down the stairs. But his little daughter whispered as she took his icy hand, isn't God upon the ocean just the same as on the land? Then we kissed the little maiden and we spake in better cheer and we anchored safe at harbor when the morn was shining clear. When the morn was shining clear. Verse 41 of our text, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? Creator of the universe. (laughs) You know, we're talking about his deity now. We've, We've looked at the human side of Jesus. Now we're talking about his deity He proves that he is God, the second in the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, three in one. Now, we shouldn't be surprised about that since we hear the testimony of John, recorded in the Gospel of John. We actually find that in in Mark, in John chapter one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter one, where John wrote, in the beginning was the word, The Word was Jesus, by the way. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. But listen to what it says in verse 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. (laughs) All things were made through Jesus Christ. He's our creator. I mean, that is to say that Christ... The Word is the creator of everything that exists. And if he has the power to create it, he has the power to control it. Amen? Amen. Now, please turn with me to Hebrews, if you would. You're going to go a little bit further back in the Bible. And uh, I'm going to look at Hebrews. If you've gone to Peter, you got a little bit too far there. But Hebrews uh, chapter 1 just want to take a look at a couple of verses, two and three. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times. I begin in verse one and in various ways, but here it is in verse two. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. I love that. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had proved purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So did you see it there? Jesus is appointed the heir of all things through whom also he made the world. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He upholds, he sustains, he takes care of us each and every day. Here we are told that God made the world through Christ and Christ sustains it by his power. And then in Colossians chapter 1, there's a a, a very similar testimony. If you go back, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then you get into uh, Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and and then Paul's letters to the churches. And, and so you'll run into Colossians back here right after Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, 
to Philippians and then Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Again, I just want to read a couple of verses. Uh, 15 and 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. Do you get the picture? I mean, Jesus is our creator. He's the creator of the universe. Jesus was with God from the very beginning. The very, and that's where God put that plan together that each and every one of us could go back to that life that was intended for us in the Garden of Eden because Jesus Christ, that plan was laid out through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when we accept that, then we can have eternal life through him. So Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of creation, and that is the testimony that we have in Scripture. And those are only a few samples of the kind of testimony that is just repeated in the New Testament regarding Christ Jesus time and time and time again. Another one is 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, and I'll begin to quit here in just a little bit, which tells it, I'm not going to quit preaching. I'm going to quit talking about his creation here for a minute, okay? But another one in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, which tells us uh, similarly that he is the one who has made everything that has been made. This is on the screen. There it is. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came, for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. So he is the creator of the universe. All things exist because he made them, and all things are sustained because he sustains them. Now, Jesus' creative power is demonstrated in every healing miracle. Think about it. Whenever Jesus healed someone, it was a creative miracle. Well, how do we know that? He had to give the person new limbs. I mean, here's a new knee, a knee replacement. Get up and walk, he said. Did he? Yeah. Where'd that knee come from? How come could the guy walk? Because Jesus created it. There was a new mind. Go and sin no more. Or new organs. I mean, all that's creation. But here in our text, on a grand scale, he demonstrates his power over the inanimate world, the wind and the waves. He's displayed his power over demons. He can control the spiritual wor world. He has displayed his power over disease. He can control the human world. And here has power over the natural creation. Okay, I said I'd quit. I mean, I could talk about feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000, but, you know, those other boats that were with him that day, they got tossed around as well. They took on water, just like the boat that Jesus was in. This was a great place for that Jesus to perform this miracle. Others were affected. You know, sometimes God brings storms into your life in order to strengthen your faith. And sometimes he calms the storm, and sometimes he simply calms you through the storm, through the storm. Now, remember I stated earlier that Mark's purpose in writing the gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, it was actually chapter 3, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God. No, actually it was chapter 1. I'll get it right here in just a minute. Jesus is not God's son in the sense of a human father. We know that. God did not get married and have a son. He didn't marry Mary, and together they produce a son. Jesus is God's son in the same sense that he is God made a parent in human form. We looked at John 1, the word Jesus became man, and Jesus, God's son, is that he was conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born 
will be called, here it is, the Son of God. The Son of God. The Son of God. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, or Matthew, rather, let's go back to Matthew chapter 26, okay? And I'm not going to go on much longer this morning. I don't think I have to. I think you've seen what I wanted to tell you. You know, Jesus is there to calm the storm. That's our Sunday school lesson, if you will. But, it, but he's also the Son of God. And, and, and we see that very clearly. Uh, now go with me, please, to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, and we're going to do 63 and 64. And... Um, Okay, here we go. And there are a lot of verses in that, in there? Matthew chapter 26, verses 63 and 64. Reading from the word of our Lord. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I, change, I charge you under oath by the living God Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, chapter, uh, now verse 64. Yes, Jesus said, it is as you say. It is as you say. But he goes on to say, but I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the majesty, the mighty one, rather, and coming on the clouds, of the heaven, coming on the clouds of the heaven. You know, there's a song that is uh, sung by Jen Johnson. Honestly, I can't remember whether we do it here or not. By Bethel Music. I, you know, I love these words. And, and they go like this. I'm not going to read the entire song to you, but a couple of stanzas here and a couple of choruses. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You're close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I'd like to ask the praise team if they'd make their way forward. My friends, Jesus will calm the storms in your life, just as he calmed the storms in the sea. In every storm, in every trial, there's an opportunity for us to examine our faith and to look at Jesus Christ for who he really is and look at his identity, his authority, and his majesty. You know, there's two truths that I want you to take with you today. One is know that Jesus is in control. Jesus is in control. We become fearful when the storms of life howl and the waves threaten us because we think we are in control. We think we can save ourselves. That's where we get in trouble. We think we can fix the problem on our own. We think we have all the answers and we think it all hangs on us and we keep one hand on the rudder just in case God doesn't know where he's going. But the good news is that we are not in control, but God is. We must remember in the storms of life amid the chaos of suffering, through all the temptations that we face in the unexpected hurricanes and tornadoes that blow against us, God is present and God is in control. The number two thing I want you to take with you today is know that he is able. 
He is able, why? Because He is God. He is Almighty God. There's absolutely no doubt that Jesus is God.